The title of my lecture tonight is The Crisis of the Western Church and the Way Forward. This lecture tonight is an extremely condensed version of a series of lectures that I gave in Australia back in the fall, and I managed to print out several copies of the larger series of lectures, and they're available on our book table back in the uh, parish hall if you're interested in following through the larger argument. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the cosmos. The one who follows me shall never, ever walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. Let's bow together for prayer for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is not a small figure on the periphery of creation, but at the very center of all things, and that he has been given to us as our Lord and Savior and our life. We ask that you would send the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of truth to us in a new and fresh way tonight, that we may see him, that we may see his stature and his standing, and the way in which he is the center of the universe that we may behold the glory of the triune God in new and fresh ways, that we may see how and where we have gone astray and see our way back to the apostolic mind. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the two centuries between 1600 and 1800, the church across Europe and the church across America and indeed across the Western world suffered two direct and brutal blows which shattered its confidence and left the church in a crisis of irrelevance. The movement known as the Enlightenment, also known as the Age of Reason, decimated the rational foundation of Christian faith and it set forward an alternative vision of God, of the universe and of human existence and life within it. And this new vision captured the imagination of the masses and led the masses as the Pied Piper into a brave new world that did not need the Christian vision, the Christian gospel, and certainly did not need the church. And the church is yet to recover. Such a secular movement did not develop in a vacuum. It was, in fact, 1,000 years in the making. And as strange as it may sound, such a secular movement had its roots in the church itself, and particularly in the great St. Augustine. The secular enlightenment is, in my view, Augustine's stepchild. It is born of his unholy marriage of Greek philosophy on the one hand and Christian revelation on the other. It was a long time in coming, But the unconverted and the ungodly and the pagan reasoning that Augustine allowed into the Holy of Holies of Christian thought finally came of age in the Enlightenment and broke free from the shackles of Christian authority like a child who grew up to abuse his parents. Pagan reasoning rose with such considerable force that the Christian vision of the universe was overthrown and a new vision of God was set in its place in a radically secular worldview was set up there and then in that moment of our history the western church lost its position it lost its standing it lost its prestige in the larger culture and since that moment the western church has been in survival mode fighting tooth and nail to get back on its feet and find a legitimate place and hearing in the larger secular culture. The last 200 years of Western church history represents a long and frantic attempt to find an acceptable basis for Christian faith and to establish the relevance of Christianity for human life in a society that believes it is of little value. From another angle, the last 200 years has seen the church retreat into itself and into its private Sunday worship in a desperate attempt to protect its own turf and hope that the storm would blow away. Today, like a boy whose dysfunctional family inevitably defines what is normal, the devastation of the church has left us, you and me, in the no man's land of ignorance and fear 
as the unwitting heirs of the Enlightenment's revolution and as sons and daughters of the saddened and beleaguered church, we are light years away from the vision, the New Testament vision of Jesus Christ as the true light of the entire cosmos. We're light years away from St. Athanasius' magnificent vision of the triune God, and we are long way away from the sheer passion and the unbridled confidence and the dreams that such vision stirs within the human soul. And we are a long way from moving out in that passion and in that confidence to explore the universe, to rethink human existence and relationships, to develop political and economic and scientific and medical and psychological and legal theories in the light of the fact that the creator of this universe is the Father, Son, and Spirit, the Blessed Holy Trinity. We have lost the fearless, bold courage, the parousia of the apostolic mind. Those brothers believed that in Jesus Christ they had come to the center of everything in this universe. They believed that they had come to the heart of the universe itself, to the very secret of human existence. And they confronted the world and they gave their lives joyfully in the service of Jesus Christ because they knew that he was no founder of a new religion. They knew that Jesus Christ was the light of the entire cosmos, the entire universe. Compared to the great apostles, compared to the fathers and the martyrs, compared to the great theologians of the early church like St. Irenaeus and St. Athanasius, the modern Western church is hiding under the altar in the dark, trembling in fear while we desperately attempt to come up with some new program that will dazzle the world when we have been given the secret of the universe. Now what happened in the Enlightenment that wreaked such havoc upon the church? What were these two brutal blows? And what is the way forward for us? as we stand here as the Christian community at the dawn of the third Christian millennium. The first of these two blows was an intellectual assault on the validity of Christianity itself. This attack was leveled by rational and philosophical argument on the one side and by scientific theory and evidence on the other. The basic ideas, our basic ideas of Christian revelation of God, entering personally into creation and entering into personal relationship with us. The ideas of Jesus Christ as the incarnate son, the basic ideas of miracles, and with these ideas, the cardinal Christian doctrine of the Trinity were attacked as being logically indefensible and scientifically impossible. Let me cite Alistair Heron here in his book, A Century of Protestant Theology, to help us get something of the picture. At the peak of the Middle Ages, around the year 1200, Christianity was more or less solidly established as the religion of Europe. And theology was regarded not only by theologians as the queen of the sciences, Christian theology as the queen of the sciences set the agenda and the pace. Politics and law, economics and philosophy, science and art all took their bearings from this overarching Christian vision. But something cataclysmic happened between 1600 and 1800 that fundamentally altered the magisterial status of Christian theology in the world. The queen was dethroned and forced to take her seat alongside of every other discipline of human thought. Theology became simply a discipline alongside of politics and art and philosophy and science. To put this another way, the gospel was reduced to one theory among several theoretical options. In fact, the situation was far worse. Philosophy and science not only withdrew from the tutelage of Christian truth, and began to stand more and more on their own feet, they also began to stand above Christianity and question its validity and its place in the world altogether. The Enlightenment was a movement in which the standards and the norms and the values of Western culture radically changed. 
It was an intellectual earthquake that dramatically altered the conceptual landscape of the times. What people considered to be believable or plausible, what people considered to be true or obvious, what made sense to the public mind in the Enlightenment was reoriented. And the church found itself in a situation where its basic ideas appeared to be nonsensical, even absurd. The situation was so grave that Claude Welch introduces his study of 19th century theology with this rather stunning statement. At the beginning of the 19th century, the theological problem was simply, how is theology possible? Or how is knowledge of God possible? This was a question of both rationale and method and included at least implicitly the question whether theology is possible at all. The second brutal blow was more psychological than intellectual and had more to do with the spirit of the times than with the sheer explosion of optimism that swept across Western Europe as the great explorers set sail and, and discovered new lands as science and philosophy and politics took center stage and offered new possibilities for the future. On the one hand, the Enlightenment represents a fundamental shift in the intellectual center of gravity in what was taken seriously and considered to be believable and authoritative and reliable. On the other hand, it represents a shift in the allegiance of the culture's heart. This is the way the Enlightenment has affected the United States. This is the way it has affected Jackson, Mississippi. In the Enlightenment, there is a shift in the allegiance of the culture's heart. The hope of the common man the hope of the common woman, the dream that we all have of a better life, of health, of peace, of prosperity, shifted from the church and its gospel to science and the creative power of the human mind. And such a shift in the allegiance of the culture's heart created a crisis for the church and established the basic issues of modern theology and church mission. How do you deal with a culture who believes that the Christian message is logically irrational and scientifically impossible? And how do you deal with a culture that has found more help, more practical help in life from science and from free thought than it found in the gospel message that it had been taught and it had believed? That is the double-edged question that faces the Christian church right now. The culture has moved on beyond the need of Christianity, outgrew it, and the culture has perceived the Christian message as hopelessly out of date, logically irrational, and practically irrelevant. That is why your friends and mine, that is why the people that live around in Jackson, Mississippi, are not seriously engaged with the gospel. Their hope has shifted from Jesus to science technology, wealth. That's the crisis that we face. From the mid-17th century onwards, the Western world embarked on a grand experiment, a secular experiment, guided not by the triune God and the vision of Christian theology, but by human reason and scientific research. Why does the Western world need Jesus? Why does the Western world need Jesus? But even here, we have not come to the real problem. It is one thing for the culture's allegiance to shift from hope in the gospel to hope in science, and for the intellectual climate of the day to turn against the rationality of Christian faith. It is quite another when these movements affect the church's vision itself. And that is the real devastating impact of the Enlightenment. The church lost its proper bearings. The church lost touch with the apostolic faith and the patristic mind. And it has yet to recover. Now to chart how this happened takes us back to the early church and it takes us back to St. Augustine and to what I regard as his fundamental error. But that is a subject for another day. If you're really interested, see the lectures that I mentioned earlier. For now, we must attempt to get a handle on the damage of the Enlightenment. 
And the reason that this is important is because your own struggles, your own lack of faith, our rather pathetic spirituality is all rooted in the fact that the Enlightenment changed our basic orientation and vision and we cannot find our way home. Let me highlight several disasters that the Enlightenment bequeathed to the Western mind. Or let me highlight the way in which the Enlightenment has shaped our basic thinking without us even knowing the Enlightenment ever existed. Number one, the Enlightenment undermined the foundation of Christianity altogether and left the church at a loss as to an intelligent basis for its own faith. There are many, many factors that figure into the rise of secular reason in the Enlightenment and its attack upon Christianity, not least the Reformation principle of the right of private judgment and the Calvinist doctrine of double predestination and Descartes' dualism when he separated, went retreated into his own mind and closed his eyes, as it were, and began to develop his theories in separation and isolation from the real world around him. But let me focus for a moment on Sir Isaac Newton and Sir Isaac Newton's vision of the universe. Early in the 16th century, Nicholas Copernicus turned the world upside down with his astonishing discovery of the fact that the earth was not the center of the universe. Indeed, the earth is not even the center of our galaxy. The earth, in fact, is just simply one planet revolving around a sun in a sea of stars and galaxies. Needless to say, such a discovery called into question centuries of church teaching and forced science to take its stand in opposition to Christianity and Christian authority. About the same time, the great explorers were braving the seas and discovering unknown lands and bringing treasures back and opening up new worlds and fantastic possibilities for the future. Their discoveries, along with the Copernican Revolution, dramatically changed the horizon of the times as dramatically as Neil Armstrong's step on the moon has done in our time. Now, coming on the heels of these shifts in the conceptual landscape, Sir Isaac Newton's discoveries of the laws of gravitation and the laws of motion gave birth to a completely new interpretation of the nature of the universe as a grand machine. This universe was designed and engineered and created by God to be sure. And God guaranteed the constancy and the reliability of all the laws that govern the universe. But God was not needed in order to understand it. That was the task of science. Copernicus and the explorers changed the western horizon. Newton's discoveries appeared to unlock the mysteries of creation. And as such, it bred a spirit of confidence in man's ability to understand not just the universe, but his own world. And such confidence birthed a fantastic surge of independent research and inquiry which produced enormous fruit. And it had nothing whatever to do with the church and Christian theology, or so it seemed. Alexander Pope's famous quip expresses the excitement and hope of that time. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. You see the shift happening? The new science set the Western world ablaze with hope for the future. All humanity really needed was to discover the laws of nature, and these laws would unlock all the secrets of our world. Health, wealth, and prosperity were around the corner. But, but Newton's conception of the universe as a closed system, a machine run by unbreakable laws, became so closed and so unbreakable that God's presence and interaction within the system were ruled out as impossible. Once God created the cosmos, wound up the watch, so to speak, and set the universe in motion, not even God could interfere with its regulation. The concept of God entering into our world in person and revealing himself to us in Jesus Christ, therefore, was scientifically inconceivable. Not even God could enter the system. It is not an accident that Sir Isaac Newton was a confirmed Arian, 
for he found the deity of Jesus Christ an impossible conception. A miracle, by definition, would be a disruption of the laws which God himself had established. The incarnation of the Son of God, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, the very idea of Christian revelation and of real knowledge of God, of personal relationship with God, all of these things were thought of as being scientifically unthinkable. As secular reason established itself and began to undermine the logical credibility of Christian knowledge and revelation, and as Newton's mechanistic system grew into the accepted, scientifically accepted framework for interpreting the whole world, and as great hope in the possibilities of science captured the imagination of the masses, the Christian concept of God as Trinity and of God's interaction with the world, of the need of salvation, the need of the church, were pushed to the side as irrelevant and unneeded and out of step with the times. Man was free to think, and man was capable, if not outright omnicompetent, to borrow one of Karl Barth's great phrases. His reason and science were all that he needed for now and for the future. Second, the Enlightenment left the church without an audience. It effectively snatched the people, the congregation, out from under the pulpit. Even if people still attended church, and they did, their hearts were not present. They weren't listening. They weren't engaged. They were looking out the window. The dreams of the common man and the vision of the culture at large shifted from the church and its gospel to the promise of science and the genius of the human mind. The future belongs to the thinker, to the adventurer, to the world of science and politics. Never mind that God is now no longer able to be involved in his own system Never mind that God cannot enter into our world and relate to us personally. We have a world to discover. We have brilliant minds to lead us and a science that will open up unspeakable blessing. In many ways, the impact of the Enlightenment upon the church and its confidence and its psychological disposition, its heart, is summed up for us permanently in the title of Frederick Slymarker's famous book published in 1799, speeches on religion to its cultured despisers. That's what the great theologian of that moment in history saw. You've got a culture that despises the church, doesn't need it. It's moved on. And so he stands to address that culture. And the very title of his book tells us everything we need to know about what was going on deep within the soul of the church as the critique of the Enlightenment began to speak. Third, the Enlightenment marginalized the Christian vision of God as Holy Trinity and created a new God for the Western mind. The Enlightenment was not a movement into what we would call pure atheism. There is and was a definite doctrine of God in the Enlightenment mind. God is the supreme architect, the creator of the universe, the great mind behind the machine, who cannot be known personally, but can be known only insofar as we can detect his fingerprints and deduce his essence by rational thought. Moreover, this God is at once distant and uninvolved, yet moral and clearly watching. The Enlightenment pushed Trinitarian discussion to the side as unnecessary and illogical and focused upon the essence of or nature of God, which it then filled with its own rational ideas. This was not a new move. The Western tradition was in need of a deep repentance about the Trinity all along. For while the doctrine of the Trinity was central to the church's technical confession, it had had very little impact on the manner in which the church thought about God's relationship with humanity, or the work of Jesus Christ, or the nature of salvation, or the purpose of the church, or the relationship between Jesus Christ and the world. The Enlightenment, far from correcting this long-standing Western problem, heightened it. it. Widened the gap in our thinking between God and talking about God and God and God. And by the way, pay attention when you're in church. Pay attention to the radio when you're listening. See how many times people talk about God. And then see how many times they talk about the Trinity. 
It's the Enlightenment's vision that has taken place and even taken over our pulpits. The Christian God is Father, Son, and Spirit, not just God. The personal, relational, present. All of that was washed out during the Enlightenment, escorted out of the intelligentsia smoking room, and the door was closed behind it. And in its place, the Enlightenment substituted the supreme being who created the world. And while this supreme being was benevolent, it was profoundly impersonal and uninvolved and detached from creation at large and from your life and from mine. Side by side with this vision of God, there was the incessant theme of divine morality. While the Enlightenment deleted the Christian vision of God as triune, it held on to Western legalism. And so, on the one hand, the Enlightenment vision of God is of an all-powerful deity who created the universe, but now remains outside of its affairs. And on the other hand, this deity is morally pure in keeping tabs. And this sense of divine detachment and impersonalness and distance, and this sense of legality and moral accounting is etched into the psyche of the Western mind. It is the way people think about God. It is the new paganism. God is the all-powerful spectator, the all-powerful moral spectator. It is utterly fascinating to note that while the Enlightenment deleted the Trinity from rational and scientific discussion, the church hardly noticed. To be sure, the church unleashed its forces to defend God, but it mysteriously failed to notice that the God it was defending had more in common with the Enlightenment's vision of God than it did with the ancient Christian vision of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Listen to this astonishing indictment from a Roman Catholic theologian named Karl Rahner. We must be willing to admit that should the doctrine of the Trinity have to be dropped as false, the major part of religious literature could well remain virtually unchanged. If we said that the Trinity is a false doctrine, then our views of salvation would remain unchanged. Our understanding of the coming of the Holy Spirit, our understanding of faith and repentance, of heaven and hell, of what salvation is, of what the church is in the midst, all of that would remain un unchanged because the doctrine of the Trinity has functioned in the Western tradition as nothing more than an orthodox prefix. You know what that means? That means that our theology that we have inherited is already tainted with the new paganism. That means our vision of salvation, the Western church's conception of atonement, the whole conception that we've inherited of the church's mission in the world is already tainted by the new God of the Enlightenment. Far be it from me to say this, but I think what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do is to be believers and to repent. To change the way we see things, to throw out the enlightenment and go back to our heritage in the apostolic church and recover the Trinity and recover this magnificent vision of the triune God that's been handed down to us. It is not a situation where we can sit comfortably in our pews. What I am saying to you is that the enlightenment's vision of God has already shaped the way you see things. It has already shaped the way you see yourself. This is why the church is so lethargic and dead and uninspired. It's not a matter of us fine-tuning an engine. It is a matter of us facing the facts that we are the sons and daughters of the Enlightenment. That our vision of God has been shaped by this pagan view of God as the distant moral spectator rather than the Father, Son, and Spirit who is here. Fourth, the Enlightenment eclipsed the cosmic Christ. It placed a veil over our minds that keeps us from seeing the stunning vision of Jesus Christ as the center of the cosmos and of human history that is handed down to us by the great apostles. The Bible, as Leslie Newbigin reminds us in his writings, is about world history. It is about cosmic history. It proclaims the creator of the universe 
and places human existence within the larger compass of a massive and beautiful plan of the triune God for the whole universe. The Bible begins with the creation of all things from the sun and moon and stars to the tiniest of creatures and it ends with the vision of the triune God coming down to dwell on earth in inconceivable blessing. At no point in the Bible, no point along the way is the God of the Bible ever conceived as a mere tribal deity, a local deity who rules over a certain segment of the world or a certain segment of the universe. Israel, to be sure, was a no-name nation that God called to himself and established as his peculiar people. But from the very beginning, Abraham and Israel, and thus Israel's election and calling, are always placed in the context of creation and in the context of the one God who created this world. The vision of the scriptures is cosmic and universal. In the biblical picture of the whole, creation is bound up in God's plan, and at the absolute center of this universal plan is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That means that the cosmos is not an accident, that the earth is not a mere speck of dust in a meaningless universe. It means that history is not a cycle that's doomed to, to repeat itself again and again and again with no forward movement at all. Behind it all lies the great plan of the triune God centered upon Jesus Christ, and in, with, and through world history, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth and adoption, is guiding history toward its magnificent end in Christ. The Enlightenment picked up this vision of history as moving forward, but it omitted the Christian vision of God as triune, and it deleted Jesus Christ as the absolute center and meaning of history. And so in the Enlightenment, you have the birth of a vision of history in terms of inevitable human progress. Its reason, its science, its politics, its discoveries brought such dramatic change and such apparent blessing that it filled the times with optimism in the capacity of the human mind and human genius. Today, you and I think in terms of human civilization, not in terms of world history. Certainly not in terms of world history interpreted in the light of Jesus Christ. That's how far the Enlightenment has already influenced us. But in the Bible, it's the other way around. The world was created for Christ. History is not the story of the rise of human civilization. History is the story of Jesus Christ. He is the center of it all. The biblical vision is of creation being called into being and of the human race being given life and existence to participate and be a part of the story, the unfolding drama of the triune God that is destined to come to its fruition in the man, the incarnate son, Jesus Christ. And once that adoption, once that relationship was forged in Jesus between the Father, Son, and Spirit on the one side and the human race on the other, human history is about the education of the human race. And not just history, but your life. Your life is about the Holy Spirit trying to give you eyes to see the real truth. The centrality of Christ in your life and in human history. The legacy of the Enlightenment is an anemic Jesus. And the impact of an anemic Jesus is that we lose the confidence. We absolutely lose the confidence that swells in our souls when we see Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the absolute center of this universe and we lose the joy of knowing that we belong to him and we lose the courage and the passion to participate in the unfolding revelation of his glory. It is in and through, as the New Testament teaches us, Jesus Christ that all things have come into being. He is the source of everything. He is the secret of the universe and of humanity and human history and of everything within it. But the Enlightenment stole this Jesus from our vision and with it our stole our vision of God as Holy Trinity. And in doing so, it drained the Christian soul of its energy. And stealing that vision, it drained the Christian soul of its passion and the exciting confidence of the apostles and their drive to understand, to work, to know, to think, and to dream. It never even crosses our minds today how Jesus Christ throws the light of life on politics and economics or on our social ills or on the world of science and its mysteries, not to mention on our vision of human history if we even have one or our educational philosophy or the practice of medicine. We 
do not even know what has happened to us. And worse, we are left to assume that such an uninspired and dysfunctional Christianity is normal. The responses of the church. The last 200 years of church history in the West has been a mad dash to recover its standing, its place, its appeal in a culture that believes it is as illogical as it is anachronistic and unneeded. The various responses of the church as a whole to this dramatic loss of prestige in the larger culture may be generally summarized under the four words denial, medication, self-salvation, and determination. When things are too difficult to bear and indeed overwhelming, there's always the option of just pretending that there is no problem. All available energy is then channeled into the game of hiding, pretending. In some quarters of the church, such denial is exactly what happened when the implications of the Enlightenment's critique and vision began to be felt. We played the ostrich card, buried our head in the sand, stopped thinking, cut ourselves off from the great questions of the day, and retreated into our own soul and into a private experience of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the private experience of Jesus. It's just that the Bible tells you that the Jesus you're experiencing is not just your Savior. He is the center of the whole universe. From another angle, the church responded to the verdict of irrelevance passed upon it by the larger culture by attempting to save itself, by attempting to justify its existence by its own creativity. It set out to create a kingdom that the culture respects. If there's any word here that applies to the church in North America, this is it. It set out to create a kingdom that the church respects. Ours is the time in church history of fabulous empires for Jesus. On the move for God. Politically up to date, correct, moving, active, alive, doing things. It's as though... We have conceded that we have no real answers and cannot possibly stand up to the Enlightenment's critique. And so we have decided to distract ourselves with religious highs and emotionalism and incessant religious busyness and all kinds of programs and dazzling special effects. And in this way, we can keep the people from seeing what the real issue is. We can keep the people from feeling the problem and its pain and we can still have church. Ours is the time of history of this dazzling world of Christian special effects. Never mind that we have nothing to say, that the culture is not already saying more clearly or has already seen through. At least we appear to be alive and up to date and relevant. You want to know why our young people are not interested in what we're talking about? In the fourth instance, the church faced the brutal facts, jumped in with both feet and a determined heart, marshaled its best minds, and began dealing with the problem head on. But how do you deal with this problem? Which way do you proceed? Where do you start? What criterion for truth and rationality are we to follow? Herein lies the great question of modern theology in the Western church. How do we proceed? How should we think? Upon which foundation are we to build? The way forward. The way forward is an unembarrassed and full recovery of the apostolic and patristic vision of Jesus Christ. Instead of reinterpreting Christ in accordance with the beliefs of the larger culture, we simply pledge to recover the stunning vision of the incarnate Son handed down to us by the apostles. And we do so, listen, and we do so in the simple faith and in the quiet and deep confidence that such a recovery will speak for itself, that such a recovery will hold its own 
and that the insights that we discover about God in Jesus Christ, about humanity, about the universe, about race relations and international politics, about marriage and family, about work and play, about economics and medicine and psychology and education, these insights will prove themselves in the marketplace of real life. We will place our theory of these things on the table because we believe Jesus Christ is the light of the world and that the Father, Son, and Spirit is the God that's underneath and behind and above all things. As science itself proceeds on the assumption, on the faith that the world it explores, whether we're talking about fish or animals or subatomic particles or planets orbiting around the sun. As science proceeds in faith that this world is real and knowable and rational, true Christian theology proceeds on the assumption and on the faith that Jesus Christ is real and that he is knowable, that he is the supreme expression of rationality. Indeed, theology proceeds on the assumption that Jesus Christ, that in Jesus Christ we meet God himself, not a part of God, not a dimension of God, not a will of God or a side of God, but God himself in person. And therefore, in Jesus Christ, we meet the logic, the life, the light, the truth that predates the universe. We meet the light that is the rhyme and the reason behind all things. We meet in Jesus Christ the one word, the logos, written into the marrow of all of creation and written into the marrow of the life of every single human being in history. And so over against Sir Isaac Newton and his closed system, which defines the incarnation it's theoretically impossible, and it rules out the Blessed Trinity. Over and against Sir Isaac Newton and his system, we remember the words of St. Athanasius to the Arians. The Arians are not only engrossed in themselves, but like the Sadducees, they think there is nothing greater or beyond themselves. And hence, when they hear that the Son is the wisdom and the radiance and the word of the Father, they are accustomed to rejoin, how can this be? As though nothing can be unless they understand it. It's an old problem. We do not begin with faith in the Newtonian worldview, in faith in Newton's mechanistic universe, and then transform our vision of the triune God into a lonely deistic engineer who cranked out the universe and sat down to watch from a distance. We begin with faith in the incarnation, faith in the belief that Jesus Christ has come to us and that the triune God has come to us in Jesus. And we proceed, and I think this is critical, this is critical. We proceed in sheer confidence that as we do so, the light that comes forth will establish a cosmic vision that will integrate the discoveries of science and it will illuminate the mysteries that have left Newtonian science speechless. Standing before Jesus Christ, we stand before God as God truly is. And as God always has been and as God always will be, and thus we stand not only before the dawn of time, but before the character and heart and, and being and will that called forth the universe and humanity within it. Here in Jesus Christ we meet the logic of the creator God, the logos as John calls him. And thus here we meet the rationale of human existence. Here we meet the rationale of marriage and relationships, the rationale of music and baseball, of stars and seas and fishes and subatomic particles. Here we are face to face. In Jesus Christ we are face to face with the hidden harmony and the order and the latent joy which eternally defines beauty and wholeness and human happiness. Here in Jesus Christ we stand before the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and therefore before the light of life, which casts its rays upon our darkness and our confusion, illuminating it once 
the haunting, inconsolable desire of every human heart. For here in Jesus Christ, if we believe in him, here we come face to face with God and we are allowed to peer into the very being of God, into in the mind of God, the logic and the heart of God, which birthed and ordered the entire cosmos. Why? Why should the Christian church be afraid? Why are we so hesitant? Why are we content with mere Sundayanity? when we confess that Jesus Christ is the light of the whole cosmos. Either God is Father, Son, and Spirit, or the Trinity is a farce. And if God is Holy Trinity, then this truth holds implications for everything in the universe, from the structure of light to what it means to be human, from the longing of every human heart to economics and international politics and human healing itself. Are we afraid? Are you afraid that God really is not Father, Son, and Spirit? Are you afraid? Is the church afraid that the Trinity is not the truth about God? Are we afraid that thinking through the implications of the fact that God is Father, Son, and Spirit for, say, marriage or economics or education or medicine or race relations is going to leave us embarrassed because of the paltry and insignificant insights we discover? Are we afraid that Jesus Christ is not the light of the world after all? Is that why we're so unengaged and lethargic and uninspired? We have accepted dysfunctional fear and shame as normal. And we have no dreams. There is no fire in our belly to go and explore this world in the light of the Holy Trinity. It is time, brothers and sisters, for the church to take Jesus Christ seriously, to believe in Jesus. It is time to believe in the Trinity and to accept our privileged calling to rethink everything in the universe in the light of the fact that the Creator is indeed the Father, Son, and Spirit. And it is time for the Christian church to stand up as if it has the greatest of all cards up its sleeve. Because it does. Is it possible? That the invisible structure of the universe, that the rhyme and the reason of human life and relationships, that the connection between human beings and creation, is it possible that these things are all alien to the triune life of the creator? Would the triune God create a universe that was wired in antithesis to the way the Father, Son, and Spirit exist? Would the triune God create a human race that is not designed to function best? after the pattern of the existence and life of the Trinity itself. It stands to reason, therefore, that to plunge ourselves and our minds and our hearts into the truth about God revealed in Jesus Christ will give us new eyes to see and a way of thinking that is inherently in tune with the deepest truths of our world and our universe and our own humanity. What will happen if we quietly put our hand to this plow, is the deck not already stacked? Will we not find ourselves standing in the light which is predestined to enlighten everything in the universe? How can it be otherwise for the God who created all things is the God who exists as Father, Son, and Spirit in a perichoretic relationship of love And that pattern of relationship, that pattern of existence, this living perichoresis revealed to us in Jesus Christ, that's the womb of the universe. And it is the pattern of existence running through the cosmos from the tiniest to the grandest of all things, from human relationships to the nature of light, from the harmony of music to the mystery of space and time. Why are we afraid? Why are we sitting on our theological butts? Why are we content with Sundayanity when we have been given access to the secret of the universe? There is work to be done.
to recover. The apostolic and patristic vision means first and foremost that we believe that Jesus Christ is truly God and that he is truly human. This is the central confession of the Christian church. But to confess that Jesus Christ is fully divine and fully human is to speak volumes, eternal volumes. The minute we confess the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, we have said something about God. And we've already said something about humanity. And we've already said something about their relationship together. To speak the name of Jesus Christ is to say Holy Trinity. And it is to say humanity. And it is to say Holy Trinity and humanity are together in union. Let me repeat that. To speak the name of Jesus, to take his name upon our lips, is to say God is Holy Trinity, and it is to say humanity, and it is to say the Holy Trinity and humanity are together in union. I want you to think that through for a moment with me. Because there you have the truth of all truths set before us. In Jesus Christ we meet God of God as the creed teaches us. But that's not all. He is not only God of God, he is specifically the Son of God. The Son who has a Father, who dwells in fellowship with his Father in the communion of the Spirit. We betray the heart of the New Testament if we can think of Jesus Christ or speak of Jesus Christ without immediate reference to the one he called Father. So in saying the name Jesus Christ, biblically, our thoughts move necessarily from a single, isolated individual man to a person in relationship. We move from Jesus to the fact that he is the Father's Son and to the fellowship and life that they share together with the Spirit. Now, here's a question. Is this relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit that we see on the pages of the New Testament, is this relationship something new? Something new that came into being for the first time at Christmas 2,000 years ago? Or does this relationship stretch back into eternity? Now the church answered that question clearly at Council of Nicaea. The relationship we see between the Father, Son, and Spirit in Jesus Christ does not begin with the birth of Jesus. This relationship is eternal. It is the eternal truth about God. So in saying the name of Jesus itself, just his name, Jesus Christ, we are saying not isolated, individual, solitary man. We are saying Father, Son. And not just Father, Son, we're saying Father's eternal Son. And so in saying his name, Jesus Christ, we're saying Holy Trinity from all eternity. And once we see that God is Holy Trinity from all eternity, we know the creator of the universe and of the human race within it. As the eternal Son of the Father, He is the one in and through and by whom all things were created, as the scriptures insist. The universe, the earth, the whole human race were called into being through the Son. St. John is emphatic. Not one thing was created apart from the Son. The Father does not create the world behind the back of His Son. That is the denial of the Trinity. He creates in and through the Son. Creation is a Trinitarian act. So to say the name of Jesus is not only to take us into His relationship with the one He called Father and to see that God is Holy Trinity. To say the name of Jesus is also to take us forward and to see that He is the Creator in and through all whom all things have come into being and have their sustenance and existence. To say the name of Jesus Christ is to say Holy Trinity and it is to say Creator. But that is not all. To say the name of Jesus Christ is to say that the Holy Trinity and humanity are together in union. For in the event of creation, pay attention, In the event of creation through the Son, there is a very definite and critical relationship established between the Son of God and the universe and the human race. By virtue of being the one in and through whom creation is called forth, 
The eternal Son is connected to everything in the universe, including every single human being. To deny this, as the Calvinists do, is to deny the deity of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. It's to say, oh no, he's not a member of that circle of life. And that the Father didn't create the whole universe through this Son. Now, what happened to this connection between the eternal Son and the creation when he entered into our world and became human? What happened to his relationship with the human race when he became one of us? Did this relationship between the Creator Son and creation fall apart at the Incarnation? Was the connection between the Creator Son and the human race, was that connection and relationship broken? Was it devastated? Was it severed? Was it destroyed when he became a human being? No. No. The relationship between the Creator Son in and through and by whom all things were created and in whom all things exist was not destroyed when he became human. It was strengthened. It was solidified and made real and abiding indeed complete and indeed eternal. The Creator Son incarnate is now the one in whom the whole human race and all of creation has been gathered together. He is, as the apostles testify, the Alpha and the Omega. He is Lord. Now what are we to make of the fact that this Creator Son incarnate who has gathered the human race and indeed all of creation to himself what are we to make of the fact that this Son now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? What are we to make of the fact that this Son incarnate has ascended, as the Creed says, and now dwells inside the circle of all circles, the very Trinitarian life of God? What does this mean? It means that the Trinity and the human race are now together in union. It means that the Trinity and the human race and creation are now together in union in Jesus Christ. Do you see this? To speak the name of Jesus is to speak volumes, eternal volumes. To speak his name is to say God is Holy Trinity, and it is to say that the Holy Trinity and the human race are together in union, for that is who Jesus Christ is. Now, one more question. Was this union between the Trinity and humanity and between the Trinity and humanity in creation, was this union forged and made real in Jesus an afterthought? Was this union between the Trinity and humanity in Christ's plan B, which God quickly thought up with the failure of plan A in Adam? Is Jesus Christ a second plan? Is the union between the Father, Son, and Spirit and the human race that is accomplished in the very person of Jesus a new idea that God dreamed up after the fall? Or is this union between the Holy Trinity and the human race, between the Holy Trinity and creation, is this union the eternal Word of God that predates creation itself and therefore the one light shining from eternity that illuminates this whole cosmos and illuminates your existence and mine and tells us who we are and why we're here and what we're after and where we're headed. Herein lies the true calling of the Christian church. The church stands before this Jesus Christ, the Jesus who is the eternal Son of the Father incarnate, the Jesus who is the one in and through whom all things were created and are now gathered, the one in whom creation and humanity have been gathered together and lifted up into union with the Trinity. The church stands before this Jesus Christ and it is commanded to believe, to take his identity and what happened to the human race and to creation in him seriously. We are called to be the place where the Christological revolution is allowed to have its way with human understanding. That is the calling of the Christian church. We are called to put this in perhaps more familiar terms to repentance. 
metanoia, a radical recasting of our minds and our thinking in the light of Jesus Christ. The truth of all truths in Jesus Christ commands us to rethink what we thought we knew about election and about a creation, about the fall of Adam, about the place and purpose of Israel. We are called to bring all our notions, all our notions of the Spirit, all our notions of the church and its mission, all our notions of faith and repentance, the Bible and sacraments of heaven and hell, every jot and tittle of human reflection we are called to bring into conformity with the person of Jesus Christ as the God-man in whom the Trinity and humanity and creation have been bound together in union. Anything less is not Christian. And it is a betrayal of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, do you not see the opportunity that is before us? Do you not see the vast political and relational implications of the simple fact that the whole human race has been gathered together in Jesus Christ? Does the fact that Jesus Christ is the one in and through whom all creation was called into being and now is united with the triune God, does that fact not speak volumes about the structure and destiny of our universe? And think for a moment of the sheer dignity conferred upon every single member of the human race by virtue of the fact that they have been created by the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. And in that same Son, they have been lifted up into union with the Father, Son, and Spirit in Christ. Think of the dignity conferred upon every single human being. And think about the way you treat people. You see here in Jesus Christ, we see who we are. We see what God has planned for us. We see our identity. And here in Jesus Christ, we're all exposed as being liars and cheats and unfaithful stewards. Because if you can look upon Jesus Christ, you're going to see the whole human race gathered together. That immediately raises a question back to you about how, therefore, do you treat these other human beings who have been gathered into this life? Do you not see the implications The one fact that this son has gathered together the whole human race and indeed creation to himself. The union between the Trinity and humanity in Christ tells us who we are. It tells us why we're here and where we're headed. And this union sets the benchmark that defines what it means for us to be wrong. And I will tell you this union in Jesus Christ between the Father, Son, and Spirit and the human race in creation is the standard by which you will be evaluated. It is the gospel that doubles as judgment. The church, the early church understood how to think Christologically in faithfulness to the fact that God is Holy Trinity. The early church knew that to say the name of Jesus Christ is to say Holy Trinity. And it is to say human race and creation are together in union. The early church set its hand to the plow to think out a truly Christian vision of creation and of human existence and history but the church in the west has lost its mind the enlightenment has so distracted us from our proper calling we don't recognize the glory of Jesus Christ when it is staring us in the face we are so far gone we think it's a heresy some new cult Brothers and sisters, we are hiding and we are afraid and we are ashamed and we are willing to give up our heritage. It is time for us to return to the truth of all truths in Jesus Christ and pour our hearts and our minds and our time and our pocketbooks into being faithful to the stunning light that comes to us in the very identity of the Son of God incarnate. And it is time for us to do so in the confidence that the light and life and love discovered will not only capture the heart of humanity, but will speak volumes to all spheres of human knowledge, from medicine to education, from politics and race relations to economics and business, from the study of light and the cosmos to our understanding of marriage and family and human wholeness. Such is the command 
of the triune God upon the Western church at the dawn of the third Christian millennium. Are you going to sleep through this? Are you going to be content with polite Sunday anity? Or are you going to respond to Jesus Christ and to his spirit and to the great cloud of witnesses calling us to move beyond Newton, beyond the Enlightenment, beyond Augustine, beyond what we think we know to the apostles? For the apostles are calling us in the Western tradition back to our right mind. The apostles and the fathers bid us to take up the truth of all truths in Jesus Christ and to take it seriously and thus to rethink. Rethink all our paganism. Rethink everything we thought we knew in the light of the fact that God is Father, Son, and Spirit and that this triune God has reached across every chasm and drawn humanity and creation into an eternal and abiding union. The name of Jesus Christ speaks volumes. It is our job to think those volumes out. If the cry of the Enlightenment was dare to think, dare to know, the cry of the Christian church is dare to think in Jesus Christ. Dare to take seriously the union between the Trinity and humanity and creation that was established in him. Dare to be bold. Dare to stand. Dare to believe that here in Jesus Christ we have come simply not to a truth or another truth, but to the truth of all truths, to the one light shining from eternity in which we can see all things new and dare to believe that such a light will speak for itself. Jesus said, I am the light of the cosmos. The one who follows me shall never, ever walk in the darkness but shall have the light of life. Amen. More light, Jesus. More light. If you would like more information about the ministries of St. Stephen's and Perichoresis, please visit one of our websites. For St. Stephen's, go to www.firstmartyr.org. That is www.firstmartyr.org. For information about perichoresis, go to www.perichoresis.org. That is www.perichoresis.org. Or for our sister ministry in Adelaide, Australia, their website can be found at perichoresis.org.au. That is P E R I C H O R E S I S dot O R G dot A U. For the Institute for the Study of Trinitarian Theology, our website can be found at www.trinitarianlife.org. That is www.trinitarianlife.org. On these sites you will find all the relevant information about these ministries, as well as links to sermons, essays, studies, and information for ordering our books and lecture series.